I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. This is another episode in the Silicon Politics series where we aim to demystify the semiconductor ecosystem in general, uh, but largely in the context of understanding India's semiconductor ambitions, right? I'm your host, Satya, and I'm a research analyst at Takshashila's high-tech geopolitics program. With me today is actually a returning guest, Stephen Izel, the Vice President for Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF for short. Thank you so much, Stephen, for taking time to be here. My pleasure. Um, so yeah, so last time we had you, Stephen, we had an extremely interesting conversation on how trade policy can craft semiconductor ecosystems, right? And the central focus around that time, uh, I think it was August last year, was India's non-committal stance on the Information Technology Agreement, the ITA-1. Um, just to recap for the benefit of our listeners, the ITA-1 is a plurilateral agreement under the WTO, um, the return of countries, including India, signed on to, and under which it is basically agreed that for a scheduled list of um, information and communication technology products um, and the inputs or components that go into making them don't don't attract tariffs as they move between global regions as they're getting manufactured and um, the final products are being traded, right? So what this effectively meant is that countries that produced electronic goods can import, an, import components the equipment that go into making them, etc., without having to bear the burden of extra taxes. Um, now, at the time of our conversation last year, we at Takshashila had just examined India's stance on the ITA-1 and concluded that we should continue our obligations under the agreement um, and potentially join the revised ITA-2 and ITA-3 negotiations. Um, just very simply because if you want to be part of the global value chains for electronics and semiconductors, we also need to have competitive exports. And for that, you need cost competitive imports as well. Um, for new listeners, I highly recommend that episode. Stephen goes into great detail about the factors that affect a country's integration into global um, value chains, especially semiconductors. Um, and since that time in August, which seems awfully long ago now, um, India has hit several milestones in its semiconductor journey, right? Um, the ITIF in February 2024 came out with a report um, assessing India's readiness to assume a greater role in global semiconductor value chains. And today's episode is going to focus on that. So um, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but this readiness assessment was born out of the US-India Quad Initiative on Critical, critical and Emerging Technology, right? The ISET. That's correct. It was a deliverable for the ISET. Right. So, um, so after that long-winded intro, uh, can you just give us the 30,000 feet view of the report, like the context surrounding the report, why is it the need of the hour and your key takeaways on it, right? So feel free to attack it any which way you like. It's a pretty broad question. Yeah, so sure. So in, in May of 2022, India and the United States announced the Joint Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technology, the ISAT, which committed the two countries to expand strategic technology partnerships and defense industrial cooperation between their nations, business, academic institutions, and government agencies. So at the very inaugural meeting of the ISET, which happened in January 2023, uh, it was agreed between the U.S. Semiconductor Industry Association and India's uh, AISA, the Indian Electronics and Semiconductor Association, uh, to develop a readiness assessment that would identify near-term industry opportunities and facilitate the longer-term strategic developments of the nation's complementary uh, semiconductor ecosystems. Um, so that's why... It, um, was the genesis of this report. As you said, we delivered it in February. Uh, I understand uh, that while well, there was supposed to have been uh, another ISAT meeting in February as well that was postponed, I understand they're trying to get it done in April, but I understand you go to elections on April 19th. Um, so uh, if, if Lincoln will be available or not, uh, I'm clear. Um, but um, so yes, this report was meant to be um, 
a readiness assessment um, and overview of uh, think of, of it like a SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis of India's semiconductor ecosystem. Um, it, it was largely focused at the request of of the the sponsors on India's policy environment. Um, so we do get a bit into the, the, the workforce, uh, the, the depth of ecosystem with like materials and component suppliers. But mainly it's about the policy environment because, you know, international investors are looking for stable, predictable, certain policy environments. And when you're looking at, you know, investments in the semiconductor sector, which is going to be two to three billion dollars for an assembly test and package facility or, you know, uh, 11 to 20 billion dollars for a fab. Um, then uh, obviously uh, investors are 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 are, are very keen uh, to assess the policy environment, and, and and as we point out in the report, that matters broadly because you know the reality um, is, is that nations have moved from being price makers to price takers in the competition to attract advanced technology industries. Uh, so companies shop the world, and they ask you know. India, Israel, Germany, Singapore, U.S., China, what do you have to offer us in terms of uh, the best uh, investment uh, incentive policies, the best digital and physical infrastructure access to, to skilled labor, et cetera? So as this report points out, countries, I'm sorry, companies assess as many as 500 discrete factors when uh, deciding where to locate a fab. And so that means for any country, region, or state in the world, you got to get check marks on those 500 issues and the quality of your check mark has got to be stronger than everybody else's. So that's what's at stake for India because many of those factors are obviously, you know, pertinent to the policy and, and kind of the, the infrastructure environment. So overall, the report concludes um, uh, that the, the key takeaway was, was this. Um, in the next five years, India has the potential to expand its presence in the semiconductor assembly test and packaging segment to as many as five facilities and to attract fabs producing legacy semiconductors at 28 nanometers or above. And actually, that's what's already started to happen um, with, obviously, the Micron investment. But obviously, just a couple weeks back, we got the news that Tata uh, and PSMC are going to be setting up um, a, a fab. Uh, and Tata is also going to do an ATP facility. So um, kudos to uh, India for uh, these, these really significant uh, announcements. Yeah, so um, yeah, so we'll touch upon the, the recent announcements and the and in fact, the, the projects have also broken ground. So we, we will see, uh, we'll ha I'll have some questions about that later. Uh, but so starting off, let's follow the rough blueprint of the report itself, right? Um, so what is the current landscape of the Indian semiconductor sector? So, so you mentioned this in, in great detail last time around. Um, but in this case, in, in the report, uh, you conducted, conducted additional research and also had interviews with a lot of stakeholders. Um, so based on that, what do you think the, the, the challenges and opportunities before the Indian semiconductor sector currently is? Um, now, it can be in terms of policy, right? In terms of industrial or trade policy. Um, so we have PLI schemes, but at the same time, maybe tariffs are not um, harmonized accordingly so that most of the benefits of the PLI scheme is going to, um, you know, sub to pay back the, the additional taxes that are being charged on the tariffs. Or maybe just general stuff about the regulatory environment, the ease of doing business, maybe. So, where do you think it stands broadly right now, um, and what has changed in recent years, and what where do you think it stands to change soon, right, from an enabling perspective? Yeah, well, I, I guess first maybe I'll talk about the the extant uh, India semiconductor ecosystem. It, obviously. India's most significant strength historically in semiconductors has been in integrated circuit design. The country, India, employs about 20% of the world's semiconductor design engineers. That's about 125,000 uh, uh, individuals. Uh, about 3,000 uh, discrete integrated circuits are designed in India each year. And virtually every one of the world's top 25 semiconductor design companies Intel, Texas Instruments, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, et cetera, all have uh, you know, design and, and often R&D centers in India, much of it, of course, located in, uh, in Karnataka, uh, down in Bangalore. Um, uh, on research, uh, R&D side as well, you're very strong. Uh, a lot of companies like uh, tool, tool, tooling manufacturers like uh, Applied Materials and, and uh, uh, LAM Research have R&D facilities in India as well. 
you know, one one challenge for India has been that despite the fact that uh, you have this depth of semiconductor design talent that really, uh, th- these are mostly in the service of multinational corporations, and it hasn't truly given rise to an indigenous sort of design players in India. Um, that's starting to change. Uh, the report um, notes that there are over 50 uh, semiconductor design startups now in India, and it profiles several very interesting ones, like uh, a, a company um, in, in um, Chennai called, called Mindgrove. Um, that is making some very innovative the, to, uh, the chips for specific application use cases in India, like attuned to you know the operating the the, the, the environmental conditions you find in India. Uh, but as the, the, their CEO uh, Shashwat Tiar explained, you know our semiconductor designers have been great historically at receiving a specification and designing it, but they haven't been great at, at conceptualizing that specification themselves. So what's really required, you know, for for domestic Indian players to get competitive in this uh, sector is a mindset change. So I think that's that, that that's starting to happen. Although one concern is the lack of venture capital uh, in India. Um, in fact, um, in 2022, um, India's uh, VC levels actually declined by 40 percent from the prior year to just 21 billion dollars, and that was three times lower than India. So one challenge for your startup ecosystem is you need a lot more risk capital to support these types of companies. So, so um, project, well, sorry, uh, because you made a very interesting point, right? So the design ecosystem, while we still have fabulous companies there, um, do you, from, from your in research for this report, can you, like, did you come across anything that would explain why in India we don't have like an end-to-end product company, like product um, firms in India, like for semiconductors, chips, exactly. So we have fabulous companies who will do the design itself and then like just sell the blueprints for the design or something like that or, or implement the design in a new SOC um, according to clients' um, requirements. But we haven't seen many product companies come up. And, and while we are for like leading edge um, general purpose computing, it will be very expensive. But say for like embedded applications, right? So IoT, uh, it's apparently the startup capital is not that much compared to uh, what we generally think about. So is, did, did you find anything that may explain why we haven't seen this in India? Yeah, I think one of the big challenges has been, um, and this is a challenge in the U.S. as well, is that um, uh, the lack of, of a foundry space uh, means it's very hard for the design companies to test out their prototypes for these new chipsets. Um, so so what happened? So, uh, well, uh, uh, you don't have the local ability to, to print the thing. Um, so then you got to call TSMC or somebody and TSMC says, well, what's your production run? And goes, well, it's just a, um, a prototype for a chip and like, well, get in line. Right. Um, so I do think the lack of, 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 of a indigenous foundry capacity has, uh, set back to some degree, the, the design ecosystem. Um, now, because really, uh, you have this India Semiconductor Laboratory, the SCEL up north, but mainly, of course, that's uh, that, that, that heretofore that's been India's only fab, um, but that's making semiconductors that, uh, for the most part, go into yeah, space and military mostly. Exactly, space military, exactly. So, so this is why I think it's really important to with these investments from Tata to get that indigenous foundry capacity. Right. So, um, so before sorry, um, please continue before I interjected. Um, oh, that's okay. Saying, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So historically, the strengths have been in R and D uh, and design, um, and that's why really the, the push to get into um, the, the fabrication, the production side of, of the ecosystem. You know, the report uh, up front talks about kind of the logic for why India should want to compete in semiconductors, right? Um, and obviously, it's a high tech industry. All countries want to attract high tech industries. Um, but the report goes through some some more, uh, um, I think I think subtle justifications, um, because India is like any country of, of, of lots of, of, of demands on on the public budget, um, and why should billions and billions of dollars go to supporting semiconductors when um, there's all kinds of social and health challenges, right? You know, it does point out that um, one reason why uh, is that uh, India uh, year over year. Uh, accrues greater deficits in trade in this sector. Um, over the past three years, India's ship imports have increased by 92%. 
and uh, your deficit in this sector uh, reached $67 billion, or at least your your, your, your level of imports for electrical and electronics equipment. So from a trade perspective, one can see why you'd want greater production. Um, but more than that, this, this semiconductor and ICT sectors have very strong employment and economic multipliers. So in India, every single job in the ICT sector uh, creates 60 uh, jobs downstream in your economy, making investments in such a sector uh, very uh, uh, so, meaningful. Yeah, it's, it's sorry possible. to interrupt here, but I, I'm, I'm extremely fasc- fascinated by this projection, right? So every single job in the ICT sector will have will create, I assume, 16 more jobs downstream. Um, yes. So, so how would, for instance, and this is something that we keep getting questions about, right? Um, when people question the the a huge amount of government subsidies that goes into setting up this plant, um, and is that like the job creation isn't that much from prime FSE. So, how do you so how do you project this as a very just a basic view of it? As um, I am talking about in the sense that, for instance, if will there be a subcontractor ecosystem that comes up? Is there um, like uh, let's say less technical? And more manpower focused jobs that uh, yeah well I mean several factors you know it was put very well in the uh, in the Obama administration uh, when they announced their kind of national manufacturing strategy in the US and they put it you know when when a manufacturing plant comes to town the Walmart follows but when the Walmart comes to town the manufacturing plant doesn't necessarily follow right so it, there's obviously jobs in the construction uh, of these facilities um, but you know the the, the the, the skill, the work level, the wage level of the jobs that, you know, sustain in semiconductor fab, you know, very high value added, very high wage jobs. Um, and those great kind of downstream, you know, subsequent, you know, em- employment multiplier effects as, you know, communities grow and uh, uh, individuals are able to uh, have higher levels of consumption uh, and that, you know, kind of flows through all of their sectors, but downstream in the economy. Um, and I promise that's the last time I'll interrupt on this. <laughs> no. uh, but that, that's a really fine. interesting uh, point of view that, that point that you made, right? Uh, and it's not something we see in the general narrative about uh, semiconductors. The usual concerns are strategic uh, or economic, as you mentioned, um, and or to capitalize on geopolitical, uh, you know, developments, right? Uh, but this this multiplier factor is not something that's usually talked about. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. No, it's definitely a huge part. Of the conversation in the United States, um, the U.S. data um, is actually less. Um, every job in the semiconductor industry uh, supports 5.7 jobs across the rest of the U.S. economy. It would be understandable why the employment multiplier would be greater in India, I think, for obvious reasons. The, the, the final reason the report explains why India is justified with the semiconductor strategy is this. Um, you know, the, the, the most sophisticated fabs in the world today. Um, are are so so their des- their design is so sophisticated that it incorporates the gravitational effects of the moon on on the assembly line. So in that way, uh, this is almost like a moonshot. And I know India has recently completed its own successful moonshot, but it, but it's a moonshot from a policy making perspective because the point is the policy making environment a country puts forward has got to be every bit as sophisticated as the sophistication of that semiconductor assembly line itself, right? So if India can achieve, you know, in, in manufacturing, they talk about learning by doing, right? The, the knowledge spillovers that occur on the factory floor. But in a like manner, there's also learning by doing or knowledge spillovers in the policy making environment. And if India can figure out how to put forth a policy making environment that supports the semiconductor industry, then in a light manner, uh, it will position itself well to attract other high-tech industries from biotechnology to robotics to artificial intelligence. Uh, and and um, I think what was also very interesting in the report was the evolution of the policy approach of the India Semiconductor Mission, the ISM. Uh, because uh, I, I think in fairness uh, to, to the great team there, uh, they did show, have shown a lot of policy flexibility uh, in the evolution of their programs. Um, specifically, when they started, um, they were only going to provide a, a, a 35% match. Uh, the industry uh, suggested that that be increased to 50%. Uh, they did uh, do that. Um, they also um, 
change their policy. Originally, the, the again, we should say so that the option option option. Nodes were also yeah, uh, yeah, made, yeah. right made, made available for any node. Uh, uh, expanded the, the the time through December 2024 to receive applications. So I think you know a lot of really strong policy making a flexibility was shown there. Um, then when um, discussions with Micron reached an advanced level um, and it came time to talk about taxing uh, or taxation, um, uh, Micron and the ISM were able to uh, negotiate an advanced pricing agreement, an EPA. Uh, these, this is an agreement that specifies kind of the tax treatment of, of relevant transactions. Uh, but it can take you know, three to four years for countries to negotiate APAs with, with, with companies. Stay tuned to All Things Policy. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Yeah, we were discussing this in office the, the other day. Is a, is a bilateral API or BAP, and apparently the the demand for such uh, BAPs is BAPAs um, is is pretty high, and the income tax department has begun to entertain quite a bunch of those. I think so. I think uh, it's the only concern is whether it's a why is it not a standard market regulatory move, right? Why is this a why is this done on an ad hoc individual basis? But yeah. So I think yeah that that's that's an interesting part as well. And they were able to do it in six months, which was was impressive. So um, uh, yeah, I think this not this theory of knowledge spillovers in the policy making environment it was really been borne out uh, with the experience uh, that the ISM has, has seen here. So I think that that bodes very well for uh, India's ability to attract other high tech industries. Right. So uh, I had a question related to this, which is that what do you think stands to change soon in this? Landscape, but I think that will be better answered after I <laughs> go through the other things. Um, so I was recently at a conference on the semiconductor ecosystem in India. I mean, it was literally called the conference on the semiconductor ecosystem in India. It was called CoSign, um, where players from the entire supply chain uh, for semiconductor so materials, for uh, fabrication, for assembly, all of them are present. And one of the factors that kept repeatedly coming up, right? Um, that it was a hurdle that almost every single one of them faced. Um, didn't matter which segment of the value chain they were in. Um, and it was talent. And I'm not just talking about the talent in the sense that um, we don't have enough doctorates or master's graduates who constantly innovate in the R&D space of the value chain, right? Um, although the entire industry's momentum is dependent on constant innovation in materials, in processes, all of that. I'm talking about it in the sense that uh, who are the personnel who are going to be running the fab that we just built? Um, the the ones with the institutional knowledge in handling advanced equipment, materials, chemicals, um, because uh, oh, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia um, have built this institutional knowledge, this workforce over, I think, a couple of decades at the very least, um, and they preserve this knowledge, right? And uh, even in India, if we build this this the infrastructure for this ecosystem, the fabs and the plants. Um, we'll probably still need to be able to absorb talent from other um, global hubs uh, who will then pass the knowledge on, right? Uh, it's not transfer of technology so much. I keep forgetting the right term. It's, it's pretty much, just, as you mentioned, learning by doing. But uh, learning also happens from looking at what people have done this for decades are, are teaching you, right? Um, so, and, so this question kept coming up. And I wanted to ask you this because while it may not strictly be trade policy or industrial policy, but it is a barrier and, and a lot of, let's say, um, in other areas, in other sectors, um, let's say in free trade agreements, barriers, uh, barriers related to labor and talent do come up. So um, in, in your research in this report or based on your personal experience, um, what's your take on this aspect? Like how do you uh, build this, this alternative talent supply for uh, the parts of the ecosystem that you're trying to build here? Yeah, I mean, I think it takes time uh, and a lot of institution building. You know, it, I was struck but, uh, on my uh, travels. I, I went twice to India in May and October of 2023 for research for this report and, you know, had the uh, pleasure of visiting several of the IITs, uh, including the IIT Madras, and, and they explained how they were building out uh, uh, an entirely new set of curriculum around kind of electrical engineering, uh, VLSI, embedded chip design. Um, so I think uh, expansion of curriculum 
um, one of the key points there was highlighted was, was actually it's not a lack of students, it's a lack of teachers. Um, so um, the, 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 the trained professorial talent, uh, you're going to have to bring into your ecosystem as well to then uh, educate the subsequent generations. Um, you know, it was pointed out that India does graduate uh, 600,000 students uh, in electronics every year, but only about 6% of that uh, those students are able to go work on uh, an electronics line immediately. Um, so I think uh, to some degree, uh, quality, uh, increasing the quality of the electronics education uh, is going to have to happen as well. One of the uh, colleagues from METI pointed out that with regard to chip manufacturing specifically, the, the skilled technicians on the chip line, you're going to need 10 to 13,000 more people uh, by 2027. So I think all across the board, um, there's uh, a definite need to expand the pool of talent to support you know, India's uh, semiconductor ambitions. Uh, you have the engineering base of students, but I think the, the quality of the education is going to have to increase. Although it should be pointed out that this is a global challenge. Uh, Delay estimates that the global semiconductor workforce is going to need to grow by more than a million skilled workers uh, globally from a base of 2 million to 3 million by 2030. And uh, Korea uh, has recently announced a, a, a national program for semiconductor skills. Taiwan has as well. The U.S. is challenged with this as well. So, so um, uh, building the, the global workforce to support this industry is, is, is a global challenge. I suppose China does have a slightly easier job of it considering the fact and this is, again, like only from reporters that I've been hearing is that uh, since they're now at the receiving end of so many export controls across the entire breadth of the semiconductor value chain, um, the the way they are trying to get talent, the people who have deep, um, long-held knowledge of how to run a fab, how to handle the equipment, um, all of that from Taiwan, from Australia, from, from the U.S. by providing quite generous, um, I mean, incentive packages. Um, I, I wonder if have you seen stuff like this happen in other any other jurisdictions by any chance? Um, because I mean the Silicon Visa, for instance, is is one thing. It's 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 one way to facilitate transfer of talent, like quick uh, movement of talent across jurisdictions. Uh, but in terms of retaining that talent, right? So even if we have someone come here, train an entire workforce for a particular fab in an end, and then they leave, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the knowledge uh, is being built upon or is being retained within a particular jurisdiction, right? Uh, so, if, do, do you have any inputs on that? Well, knowledge, of course, walks on two feet. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's, I mean, at one level, it's a policy issue. Uh, yeah, with, with, with the, then hopefully the Indian government will be uh, quite alacritous and smart about uh, ensuring that the individuals get the visas they need to, um, you know, come and, and work in India in this sector. Um, but then a lot of that's a corporate question as well, right? I mean, I mean, knowledge, talent, and retention is a is a massive challenge for for any corporation, and uh, uh, you know, it's and, and it's also a social, social thing as well. Like, do I want to come in and live in these places? Uh, how attractive is it to be in, in, in Gujarat or Karnataka? Delightful places, but <laughs> a lot of people make those decisions. But you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, in China, um, I mean, you're right. I mean, I mean, their thousand talents program. Is, is of course their uh, kind of a, a talent attraction. Uh, the, what do they call them? The, the sea turtles, I guess, is what they, the term for trying to bring uh, the, the Chinese citizens back to the country. And yeah, no question. I mean, um, I mean, no, the I mean, average stories of engineers uh, from Taiwan being offered million dollar incentive packages just to come and work in, in China. So, um, the, as I've said before, China uh, pursues. Uh, and all of the above technology acquisition strategy, <laughs> uh, not just IP <laughs> theft, <laughs> but it's also attracting talent through all types of means. We can talk about that if you want. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so it's just a point to highlight that maybe yeah, yeah. other jurisdictions need to think about it in a similar manner in, in the sense that the incentives need to be there in order for talent to move in the first place, right? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so then let's just move on to the, the 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 recent news about the fact that uh, we had the approval and the groundbreaking of a 28 nanometer fab at Dholera, Gujarat, and two assembly plants, one also in Gujarat and the other one in Assam. Um, now, combined with things that are already underway, like Micron's assembly plant, uh, this is the question that I had before, which is, uh, what do you think the uh, challenges that exist? Challenges that face these ventures, right? The the 
benches that will start producing their final outputs in let's say in the next two to five years uh, what do you think stands to change soon or to to ameliorate these challenges if any i, I mean th- these these announcements being so nascent um i guess it's some, to some degree hard to say uh you know hopefully while the required you know permits approvals uh will will happen smoothly and and those types of bureaucratic issues won't hold up construction i, I mentioned that because those types of issues are holding up construction uh, facilities in the united states um uh, in arizona with the tsmc plant in particular uh there's been uh issues with uh with, with, with regulatory permits, uh, there's been issues with unionization uh, and uh, contract issues. Interestingly enough, in the United States, here's, here's an interesting thing: um, that to, to build these semiconductor fabs, again, very complex systems, uh, you have to have specialized cranes that that oh, to build a facility. Yeah. And there's only one manufacturer of cranes of that quality in the United States. Oh, I so, had no idea. Wow. Okay, so, that's the bottleneck. Right. Oh. So, so, so little, little technical issues like that. Yeah. So, a lack of a, la- a lack of uh, qualified cranes is, is is a key thing holding up uh, uh, construction of the fads in Arizona right now. So, so issues like that. Um, who knows if if, 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 they'll, if they'll rise? Um, uh, I have I have heard uh, stories that um, my client is finding it challenging to to find the, the skilled individuals uh, they need for their facility. Um, I don't know how uh, that how deep that issue is, but I've, I've read that in news reports. Um, so um, the paucity of of skilled tunnels we just spoke about uh, may be a challenge uh, for for Tata um, and PSMC as they move forward. Right. So so that brings us to the final question perfectly because um, again this is this relates again to the fact that you know may perhaps Micron is finding it difficult for uh, personnel skilled person to find skilled personnel, and also maybe um, as we see the global semiconductor value chain itself um, undergo some serious shuffling, right? So, for instance, um, some elements of packaging will may also move to the foundry stage, right? So, as you begin to see more slow, slow down and node shrinks will possibly become less relevant and development of more advanced packaging techniques, you know, like interconnects, chiplets, and what have you, um, right? So, as this become more and more important um, and move, move out of the traditionally downstream stage of the value chain, uh, what opportunities might India have there, right? So again, in that conference that I went to, um, so the idea was that perhaps India's chip design talent can be leveraged in package design as well. And and when this idea came up, didn't find much traction. But uh, again, I'm unclear about whether that means additional opportunities arise or not. Because uh, as far as I know, India's uh, niche in the design segment of the value chain is in the low in the is in the downstream part of that segment as well, in terms of verification and stuff um, and not the not the freezing of the core architecture right so and stuff like that so right so so aside from the capacity question so do you think there are any opportunities that india may have there uh, you you mean like in an atp or yeah, other so, so as atmp uh, fragments and also like becomes more and more merged with the foundry part as advanced packaging begins um, i mean assume i mean as to be competitive we should also probably Start thinking about it. Like ten or twenty years down the line, we should also have a foothold there. Um, so, how do we have an existing jump-off point right now, or do we have to build that from scratch? Kind of thing is pretty much what I'm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you're just getting started in the production side of semiconductors, really. Uh, whether it's foundry or ATP, right? So, but you know, I think you're starting from the base, right? Which, which is um, a, kind of a powerful position to be in. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, there's a wonderful Wall Street Journal article um, a couple of days ago about how, um, you know, companies have a, a $1.5 trillion global challenge is old software inside companies. As you know, the like old banks and airlines have, you know, built code upon code over generations yeah, yeah. and it's very problematic. But it would point out that for companies that are just starting off today, like like new banks, they can be very disruptive because it's, it's Greenfield, blank slate, and they can deploy systems with, with, with the newest code, the newest software. Um, so I think in a light manner, w- w- with India, starting with the base, we get clean slate, um, then you can really kind of you can chart your own future in the sector. So I, you know, I view it as an opportunity. Um, but, you know, I think one thing that would help India is like really to have a 
a, a national semiconductor skills strategy because because you got to build a real talent base that that uh, outside of the design ecosystem really isn't there yet. So that's going to require whole of government investment coordination with universities, um, with the private sector, uh, etc. Um, so I, I, I would I, I would say at this point. You know, a lot of attracting the micron uh, was that was a proof of concept, right? You know, prove that India can do it. Um, and now that you're over that hurdle, um, the next challenge is prove that you can build a broader and deeper ecosystem that has a talent behind it. I want to say one more thing though on the trade side, and and we just had the World Trade Organization 13th ministerial uh, completed in the uh, UAE. Um, and, and at that meeting, uh, we had another a two-year extension of the WTO the moratorium, yeah. customs duty moratorium. Uh, it, some commentators speculated that this might be the last extension of the moratorium. And I hope that Indian policymakers understand that if India ever has the ability to impose a customs duty on the movement of a semiconductor blueprint design or the blueprint for a semiconductor fab, um, there would be nothing more damaging that India could do for its semiconductor aspirations than to get its way on the e-commerce customs duty moratorium. Yeah, I think that's also something that we are working on right now um, and trying to figure it out because um, it does. It, it the, one of the primary arguments seems to be lost revenue in terms of taxes, and that isn't really much. The quantum of it is is tremendously small compared to what the the kind of economic growth you'd normally see if you enable this uh, movement of services, right? So that's kind of uh, slightly odd. And and the initial answer is also just, you know, just just apply value added tax on it, right? So it's, that's still fine. You don't have to, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, like add customs duties on top of it. Um, and and so, so again, this, again, the last point about trade is just kind of industry people talking about the needless red tape surrounding import of, let's say, refurbished semiconductor equipment for uh, facilities, right? Um, and uh, that is so. That is one way in which you, uh, let's say, build capacity by training uh, people on, let's say, lagging edge equipment, but still pretty advanced. So you begin building the institutional knowledge required in the country across the entire ecosystem, um, slowly and steadily, at a much lower cost. And you can also like you can spin up much more quicker and reach time to market for your products. Uh, but apparently that is not that is not something that happens in India for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, I can't find any public uh, data regarding this. Uh, it's not like a government websites are, are pretty, uh, let's say, enlightening either. Um, so yeah, so on, on that front as well, uh, like stuff, things like this, which are not readily apparent in trade policy, generally speaking, can also be a huge impediment. Yeah, absolutely. And I know um, with... Um standards and certifications, um, especially with the refurbished equipment, this is long been a challenge uh, for India. So you know, hopefully policymakers realize that, that every, every time a policy is promulgated that isn't really value adding for an economy or for society, uh, it adds to the cost of doing business. And uh, this is a factor that global companies consider when, when making investment decisions. So uh, that's why the quality of policymaking has got to be really, really high to support um, competitive industries in, in uh, these sectors. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, and, and that was an excellent conversation. Um, thanks, Stephen, so much. I, th- I think we've come to the end of it for now. We'll probably have more uh, episodes down the line on, on a lot more aspects of the ecosystem. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out. Um, and to all our listeners, stay tuned for the next episode of All Things Policy and the next episode of Silicon Politics. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM Network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.